So focus here is on um, a model again of firm behavior. Uh, critical assumption is when we're, we're modeling the behavior of the firm, we're assuming the firm's that price taker. So the product of producing, uh, product Q, um, has some price in the market, P, and this is uh, taken as given. So no ability to negotiate or even to influence the price through its own supply decisions when it picks Q. So what I want to do in this video is look at some short-run problems where uh, I'm going to have a firm produce a product Q with some sort of production function, and I'm going to have a fixed capital input. So we'll assume, of course, there's just two types of inputs or factors of production, uh, like we typically did when we talked about cost minimization. So I have a, a production function that uses labor and capital. And we'll be doing the same sort of profit maximization problem that we did on the previous video. Um, this time, though, I'm just going to uh, fix this capital input. And the only choice for the firm is the labor input. So the profit maximization problem is actually going to become a little bit easier. Um, we can just do a few different applications looking at costs and deriving uh, equilibrium in the market and so on. So I'll show you that. So uh, what I want to do is um, then jump into an example here. And I'm going to uh, stick to the, the same uh, case where we're looking at uh, firm producing good Q using a Cobb Douglas production function. So, in my example, I'm going to again do um, Cobb Douglas. And uh, for a production function, let's say that I'm producing good. Um, Producing good Q using a production function of three times L to the one half times K to the one half. And for a short run, we'll say the firm's operating in the short run. So we have a period of time, right? The definition of short run is simply a period of time in which um, certain inputs that they use in the production process, they cannot change. So it's a shorter period of time where typically the assumption is that certain capital inputs um, cannot be adjusted, which is going to generate a fixed cost. So I'm going to have um, K uh, fixed here at 16 units, um, for better or for worse. And then to keep prices a little bit general, um, so for general prices, which we can add examples when we want to, we just have a um, good Q has a price that will just denote P. What else is there? Labor has a price PL, and capital has a price PK. So these are all parameters. They're known prices. I'm just not going to assign them numbers and work through my profit, maximize, <laughs> profit maximization problem. So um, what we're looking at then um, in the short run is you can plug in the, the fixed capital that the firm has, so 16 units, and simplify the production function. So in the short run, we have a production function where I'll just evaluate this Cobb Douglas production function at the given amount of capital. So I have Q equals, and when I plug that in, I'm gonna plug that in right here, take the square root of K. So I'm gonna take the square root of 16, which can be four, four times three is 12. So I'll have 12 times L to the power one half. All right, so that's what we'll be working with as my short run production function. Like we did in the last video, um, you can maximize profit a couple different ways. So I'm looking at uh, maximizing profit, um, one approach, is to um, solve the problem in terms of the input uh, and not use a total cost function. And we can do this either way, like we did last time. This is going to be a lot easier now simply because um, I only have the one type of input, right? So if I'm looking at my profit, my profit in this case would be uh, the price that I sell the good at um, times the number of units I sell uh, minus my cost. So PLL -L minus PKK. The output Q here I can express is uh, in the form of the production function that's given, right? So I have, um, or what I'm trying to do is maximize um, P times 12 times L to the one half um, minus, and then for PL, we just keep that at L and minus PK, um, K bar is fixed. I should just write that as 16, I guess. So K is at 16, so I'll just plug that in. All right, so that's what I'm trying to maximize. So. I'm going to essentially choose my variable input to max profit. So to maximize profit, what I can do is take the derivative of the profit function there in the short run with respect to my variable input labor. 
and set that first order to be equal to zero to find the critical point. So from a first order condition, um, what I'm going to do is take the derivative of this right here. So this would be one half P times 12 times L to the minus one half. And then take the derivative with respect to labor, right? So minus PL uh, equals zero. So just a note here, I, was, I meant to mention this in the last video, but I forgot. Um, if uh, I'll solve that, so one sidetrack here. <laughs> Um, what I'm looking at here is generally is the price of the product times the output, and the output is being generated by some sort of production function. And then I have these costs, cost of my labor and the cost of my capital. When I look at that first order condition, uh, what I'm doing is taking the partial derivative with respect to labor. So I'm taking uh, P, and then I take the partial of F with respect to labor, minus PL, and then I set that equal to zero. So this is exactly what I did here, just sort of generally speaking. Um, this right here is just the partial derivative of the production function with respect to an input. Uh, we've called that before marginal product. In this case, it's marginal product of labor um, because I'm taking a partial with respect to labor. You can do the same thing with capital if capital is variable. So this is my marginal product. Uh, in this case, notice I'm multiplying that by P, right? So uh, one way to sort of interpret this, and sometimes it gets written, is that they call this right here, uh, marginal product of labor is measured in output, right? So it's the additional output I get in Q when I increase L a certain amount, so a small amount. So this is measured in output, and then I'm multiplying that output by its market price P. So sometimes what they call this is they call this uh, marginal uh, revenue product of labor. Or oftentimes the way you'll see it is MRPL. So um, when I'm trying to maximize profit, with this approach, right, row numeral number one, uh, what I'm doing, sometimes the way this gets written, is I'm taking the marginal revenue product of the variable input and setting that equal to the cost of the input, right? So this is like, I think about this as kind of like the marginal cost of the, the labor input. In this case, it's just fixed, right? Every unit you buy costs you PL, so it doesn't, um, it's not nonlinear. So by setting your, um, what you're doing is you're setting your MRPL equal to that price of labor, and that's allowing you to solve for L star. All right, so that's, the, um, that's how that gets expressed. We've done this already uh, with the math. I just forgot to mention the, the marginal revenue product definition that gets assigned to this uh, part of the math, the math step. All right, so let's go back to um, solving this, right? So that was just uh, some vocabulary. So what I want to do is solve this for... <laughs> Solve this first order condition uh, for my optimal L. So I'm going to, this right here is uh, one half of 12 is six. So I have six P um, over L to the power one half equals PL. And so I'm trying to solve for L. Um, so I can rewrite this as six P over PL um, equals L to the power one half, or then finally solving for L. So you have L star if I just square both sides. So 36P squared over the price of labor squared. So that would be my <laughs> optimal L star. And then um, I know what K star is, or K bar, call it, right? That's fixed, so we have that. That was 16. So um, I have these two uh, input choices, which then I can use to calculate what sort of output I'm going to get. So if I'm looking at my output, Q, I know I have a short run production function. I think it was 12 L to the one half. So given market prices in front of me, uh, P and PL, um, this is how much labor the firm will purchase in order to maximize profit. Um, and so what I could do is then link uh, how much uh, output will be produced total um, given the market prices in front of the firm. All right, so I just plug in O star. So I have Q equals 12 times L, and this is 36 P squared over P L squared. And this is all the power one half. So when I plug that in here, um, so I'm taking square root of all this. So this is going to be Q equals 12. And I'm taking square root of everything in the brackets, I guess. So the square root of 36 is six. And then this would just be market price, and this would just be P L. <laughs> All right, so when I multiply that through, um, 12 times 6, 72 times 6, and 
everything else is the same, right? So let's put it this way, uh, Q star, um, call it like a supply, should be uh, 72 times whatever the market price is uh, divided by PL. Right, so that'll be my supply function for good Q. Good. All right, so um, call this the supply uh, by my firm. So this is just a, um, a way to link up market price to optimal Q that the firm produces. The higher price is here, that is the higher the market price, uh, the higher output the firm will produce. So you get this positive relationship between market price and supply, so you get an upward sloping linear supply curve, something like this. So that's my supply. P and Q. All right, so let's do the same thing now uh, with the other approach, that is same firm. Uh, let's just generate a total cost function this time and then put that in a profit function. And when I'm maximizing, I'm maximizing with respect to Q, not labor. All right, it's the same thing we did in the last video. So call this Roman numeral two where we're trying to maximize profit. So I'm looking at total revenue minus total cost, which is P times Q, and then I need my total cost function. All right, so let's get the total cost function in terms of Q, and then we can leave revenue like this and not use labor or capital. All right, so I need that total cost function. Uh, in this case, in order to figure that out, I need to know what L is, and I need to know what K is. K is given, right? So that's fixed. So we'll say uh, same fixed 16 units that we used last time, I guess. And so for my production function, um, for, for finding labor, I can use the production function, which I think was Q equals 12 L to the power one. 12 times L to the power one half, right? So in the short run, this was the production function we had, given the capital was fixed. So I can just solve for L. So I have Q over 12 equals L to the one half. Or if you square that, you get Q squared over 144. So my total cost is then going to be PL times L plus PK times K. So I have PL is just PL and L is Q squared over 144. And then PK is PK, K is 16 we have. So that would be my total cost function that I derived um, before I maximize profit. All right, so when I'm back to my profit maximization, I'm looking at maximizing P times Q, which is a revenue minus this total cost function. So minus PL Q squared. Make sure this doesn't look right. I think there should be a positive there, right? So this is just the expenditure on labor. Uh, this is the expenditure on um, capital. So I have minus PLQ squared over 144 minus PK16. So take that negative through the entire cost function. This here is just a fixed cost this is a variable cost. So I'm going to take the derivative, first derivative of the profit function with respect to Q. Notice there's uh, no labor here and there's no K, uh, at least it's, well, it's 16, right? So I'm writing this in terms of Q. And what I'm trying to do is maximize. So I take the derivative with respect to Q for my first order condition. We have P, this is marginal revenue, minus marginal cost, which would be 2PLQ over 144. And I set that equal to zero, right? Or P equals um, PLQ. And then 2 goes into 144. 2 times 7 is 14. So like this, I think. So this right here is your marginal cost. So it's the derivative of the total cost function here with respect to Q. And this right here is market price, which in this case is marginal revenue. Every time the firm sells an additional unit of output, they sell it at whatever the market price is, P. So if I sell one more unit of output Q, um, and then ask, uh, what would be the increase in my revenue from selling an additional unit? The increase in your revenue will be whatever market price is, right? So this is a true in a perfectly competitive market. In a perfectly competitive market, 
So in my perfectly competitive market, uh, marginal revenue for the firm is always whatever market price is. Right? So they sell marginal revenue equal to marginal cost and then solve for Q. So Q star equals um, 72 times price divided by PL. And so that would be my be my supply. I think that's what we have before. Anything here? So 72 PPL, right? So you get the same thing here. So this is the same. All right, so that would be the supply decision by the firm if we take the approach um, where we first get the cost function and then go from there. Um, so notice uh, just for some, um, some uh, you can take this uh, in the same problem, you can take this uh, total cost function that we derived, which was PLQ squared over 144. Uh, plus PK times 16. So that's just what we had uh, right here, right? So we derive that total cost function in order to then put it into the profit function and solve for Q star. Um, you can, from here, you can find marginal cost, right? So we did that. The marginal cost would be the derivative of this, which was, um, yeah, that is. So if I take the derivative of this, we had PLQ over 72. You can also um, look at the average total cost. So this is my fixed cost and my variable cost. Average total cost sometimes is used uh, as a way to sort of model uh, the supply curve and what sort of profit the firm is earning. Um, for example, in principles class, when you're teaching this, you would be uh, often using a model where um, you plot out average total cost and use that to show where what sort of profit the firm earns at its optimal Q star value. So. Average total cost is just defined as TC over Q. So if you take this right here, PLQ squared over 144, and divide that by Q, and you have to do the same thing with this, PK 16 divided by Q, um, you're going to get this Q is going to cancel with one of those. So you just have PLQ over 144 uh, plus PK 16 over Q. So that would be my uh, average total cost. of uh, production for a Q, right? So if you have a given Q value, you um, this would be your average cost of production. So take the total cost, divide it by the number of units you're producing, and this is the, the average cost per unit. So how does this look? Um, so um, what, what we usually do when we're sort of using that model in principles class is a graph like this, where you have um, Q on the horizontal axis, and this is just dollars. And so what happens is this sort of uh, um, has this U shape to it. So um, if you take the first derivative, so if you take the derivative of average total cost, um, you can find a critical point here for this. So if I take the derivative of this, then what I have is um, PL over 144 would be the derivative of this with respect to Q. Um, plus, <laughs> and I'm taking the derivative of this here. Um, so this would be, uh, you use my quotient rule, right? So the derivative of the numerator is zero. Um, and then the derivative of the denominator is one times PK 16 Q squared. That's the one. So this is the first derivative of average total cost. I'm going to set that equal to zero to find the critical point. So you get PL over 144 equals, and then this is negative. So bring this on the right side, and I have PK 16 over Q squared. So this is the same thing as uh, Q squared equals, and then PK 16 times 144 uh, divided by uh, PL. So I get Q squared equals 16 times 144 is, who the heck knows, something like 2304. And then I want to take the square root of that. So if I take the square root of that, um, you 48. So Q equals 48 times PK over PL. So this would be the critical point here um, to see whether it's a max or min. 
What it can do is if you look at that first derivative with respect to Q, uh, which is this right here. So I have PL over 144 minus PK 16 over Q squared. Uh, what I can do is I'm going to take the second derivative to see whether I'm at a local max or min. So I'm going to take the derivative of this with respect to Q. So I'm taking the second derivative of average total cost, right? This is just DQ squared ETC. So I take the, the derivative of this with respect to Q is zero, and then this would be uh, minus zero. So zero minus Q times PK16 over Q4. Yeah, I'm using quotient rule. Or you give you Q minus two, it's probably quicker. Um, so I have the minus out front here, right? Leave that. Times Q squared minus 2Q. I think I did that right. Did that look right? So that's just going to be positive 2Q PK16 Q4. Positive one's critical. You can cancel a Q if you want. 2 times 16 is 32. All I need is the sum elements, but this is positive. So what does Professor Banerjee say? Um, if the second derivative of the function is positive at the critical point, that means the slope is increasing. So what happens is you get a critical point here like this, and then you get something like this. And this is my average total cost. Uh, your marginal cost function is PLQ over 72. So it's going to be uh, linear, and it looks like this. It's going to intersect average total cost at the average total cost minimum. That's easy to confirm. And then what happens is you get a marginal revenue line that looks something like this. Or this is market price. Okay, and so hopefully that picture right there brings back memories. Very good memories. When you're taking principles of microeconomics for the first time. And this was introduced in order to show you where the firm maximizes its profit, which would be where marginal revenue and marginal cost intersect. So the professor said Q star will maximize profit. And then the revenue would be P times Q. So that's your revenue box. Total cost will be Q times average total cost. So that's your total cost. And then this rectangle here would be your profit. All right, so sometimes that model gets used in teaching this. It's all just sort of built from the short run profit maximization problem they're working on. Uh, let me show you one more thing with this model before I kill it off. That is, uh, let's do that same example where I have um, the same production function. And I'm going to use my cost. So I had, I think it was this, right? And then we had K was 16. So in the short run, you had uh, Q equals, and then 4 to 3 is 12, so we had this. And then we had prices that were given. Uh, we kept those general. So you had a P, PL, and P, PK. So what I want to do uh, this time is uh, show you. So what we did is we maximized profit. And we got a, um, an individual supply curve for a firm, right? And then the firm said the Q star, right, the optimal supply, uh, by the company, it'll be a function of the prices. And so what we got there was this, we derived this um, two times, right? We had 72 times price divided by PL. All right, and, and we finished there. What I wanna show you is you can actually use this model to generate um, uh, a P. So usually what happens is you're sort of given uh, a market price P. So a firm looks at the market price or a price taker and the firm picks Q star. Um, what I can do is if I have a functional relationship here where I know exactly how much output a firm will pick, if I also have the number of firms that are um, in the industry producing good Q, the idea is usually in a competitive market, you have a number of firms like this. Um, what I can do is then use this, this functional relationship and take the number of firms that are producing and use that as a way to figure out exactly what sort of price uh, we see in the market. Uh, what, I, what I need here is I, I need also a demand curve. So I'm going to show you how that works. So take an example of that. So for my example, to simplify, let me pick some input prices so we don't have to keep those general. So to simplify, let's say PL, um, let's say PL is 12. 
and PK6. So what that means, right, is if you take your total cost function, and I'll write that out like we derived it earlier. So we had PL times Q squared over 144 plus PK times 16. <laughs> so if I plug in those input prices, I have 12 times Q squared over 144 and PK is 6. Okay, so now I get this total cost function here. Um, 12 goes into 144 12 times, and 1 over 12, let me put that in decimal. So I think we can get here 0 0.083. I think it's repeating, but we'll just round there. And then 6 times 16 would be my fixed cost, 96. All right, nice and neat. All right, that's my total cost function. Um, the supply by the individual firm is Q star equaling 72 times market price divided by um, this price of labor, which I'm going to, again, assume in this example is 12. So I have, this is 12. So 72 divided by 12, I don't know what's in 72 divided by 12. Six, thank goodness. So six times B. All right, so if I have a market price, this is what um, an individual firm will supply. So the idea here is uh, a single firm Uh, looks at price, right? Looks at market price, P, and supplies this much, six times P. All right, so the market price is ten dollars, and then we'll supply sixty units. Uh, if I have a um, a certain number of firms in the industry, so say for example, n equaling ten, just to make up a number, n equaling ten firms uh, produce and supply good Q, right? So they're all supplying the same good. Let's say they're identical firms. Just so that uh, once I have a supply curve for firm one, then they all have the same thing. You don't have to have this, then you have to sort of solve the problem 10 different times. But to make it easy, we'll say they're all identical. That's great. Uh, so what you can do is then calculate aggregate supply. So here we're moving into macroeconomics, I guess, right? So you have a uh, a market price like ten dollars, one firm will make sixty units. So if I have two firms, they would make one hundred twenty units, right? So I'm just going to multiply this individual supply amount by the number of firms, right? So aggregate supply, let me call this like Q aggregate, and let me call this Q supply aggregate. How about that? Um, is going to be just n times the amount each individual firm produces, so six p. Right. So what I get here is I get um, n six p obviously would be my aggregate supply. Oh, I'm sorry, I meant to put in 10, right? So if I have 10, uh, I have 10 times six is 60. All right, so my supply curve aggregate would be 60 times P. And notice this is just uh, how much firms will produce to maximize the profit if we have a market price. So given some market price, they choose what to supply. If I'm trying to figure out what price is, notice, uh, suppose you're given a demand curve. That is an aggregate demand curve. So what I mean by that is I have some sort of demand to supply for good Q aggregate. That's a function of price. Let me just take something linear, um, very specific, so easy to work with. So for example, say quantity demanded is 940 units minus one half times P. All right, so I have a linear downward sloping demand curve. Um, so what that means is I have aggregate uh, supply and now I have this given aggregate demand curve with summarizing consumer behavior. So I can use that to find my, uh, my equilibrium price in uh, the market for Q. So um, to do that, all I'm going to do is I'm going to take my supply curve and my demand curve, right? So you have the supply curve is US equals 60P and QD equals 940 minus one half P. All right, so I have a linear demand curve and a linear supply curve. How about that? And um, what I can do is then calculate the, the equilibrium price. So, for example, if you set quantity supply equal to quantity demanded, there should be some equilibrium price. And if we pick it just right, demand and supply quantity will equal, right? So quantity supply is 60p. Quantity demanded is 940 minus one half p. 
So if I add that here, so 940 divided by 60.5. Is 15.54. So that's my equilibrium price, right? So the way that looks, right, just to celebrate here, is you have Q and you have P. Quantity supply looks like this, basically. Main curve looks like this. All familiar with that, right? And so what this is right here is my $15.54. Okay, so this uh, model of the firm allows me to generate a supply curve and then an aggregate supply curve. And if I have a demand curve, then you can circle back and calculate what the market price is. Um, and you can calculate profit the firm earns, right? So if you want to see how much profit does a firm earn, uh, the profit for a firm should be um, total revenue minus total cost. We were looking at four, which is P times Q uh, minus uh, total cost function. I think we just did that actually, right? That's right here. So in this example, we derived total cost earlier <laughs> with those prices. So I can just plug that in. So I get um, minus 0 0.083 Q squared minus 96. So that's my profit. Um, I need to know what Q is. Right now, I have price. Price is a uh, fifteen point five four. Q is going to be whatever Q star is, the profit maximizing choice by an individual firm. So I know that um, I know that Q equals six times P, right? And six is six times P. P is fifteen point five four. So I take fifteen. 0.54 times 6, you have 93.24 units would be the supply decision by the firm. So if I plug that in, so you have 15.54 times 93.24 minus 0 0.083 times 93.24 squared minus fixed cost 96. All right, I put all that in my calculator and I can see how the firm is doing. All right, so 15.54 times 93.24 is like one, four, four, nine. 93.24 squared is that times zero eight three is that. So seven two one variable cost minus ninety-six and fixed cost. And there we go for the profit. So this plus ninety-six. This made a grand total six hundred thirty-one dollars. All right, so that'd be my profit. Um, this is uh, given this number of firms in the industry, right? So this assumed you had 10 firms, which is kind of random, right? I just did it as practice. Uh, what you can do is you can go from here, you can go into long run equilibrium, where not long run, we can go as you can say, if profits are positive like this, right? This is positive. Uh, how many firms would I have to add? to drive the price down to the point where profit is zero. I might have you do that in the homework. The idea is if you keep increasing N, what happens is the supply curve kind of shifts in this direction. Right, so this is a N greater than 10. And as you shift the supply curve to the right, uh, that drives down P star. And as P star goes down, each firm responds, but profit will go down as well. So eventually you can force profit to zero. And then the argument is that you have this sort of equilibrium in the industry. That is, once pro economic profit is zero, there's no more entry by firms into the market, and you have this sort of equilibrium size to your industry. All right, I'll stop there. That's good enough. I'll put some homework together for you guys, and you can give it a go.